Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar series for parents' parenting tips. Today, we're going to talk about responsive classroom strategies that work for home. So, what is responsive classroom is what we're gonna start sharing. And they have a really um, nice slogan that they're promoting during this time of pandemic, and it is maintaining a positive community remotely. And basically, this is a student-centered social and emotional approach to teaching and discipline that consists on a set of evidence-based practices designed to First, create joyful and engaging classrooms like build a sense of community within the classroom and strength the relationships between students and with the teachers and also be, build a sense of belonging in school communities. So I would like to show you a very short video about responsive classroom and then we go ahead with the strategies and tips for home. Every child deserves a warm, safe, and joyful learning environment. A place that supports them to take risks, to learn, and reach their full potential. That's the core principle of Responsive Classroom, which is now used in classrooms and schools across the country. Responsive Classroom is not a separate curriculum. Instead, it's an approach to teaching. It offers educators practices that they can use throughout the day to expand children's learning and create positive communities both in the classroom and throughout the school. Responsive classroom techniques don't end at the classroom door. They can be used to build a positive school culture as well. Two major studies concluded that the responsive classroom approach increases student engagement, improves academic achievement, decreases discipline problems, and leads to more high quality teaching. Responsive classroom has helped me to become a better teacher. So I think it's totally changed my approach to how I interact with them. I notice a change in my effectiveness as a teacher with morning meeting and with responsive classroom as a whole. My favorite thing about the responsive classroom is that it works. I've seen it work as a classroom teacher. I've also seen it work as a building principal. Everyone is invested in what we're doing for kids and that's the power of school-wide responsive classroom. Okay, so in our school, we started implementing it two years ago with great resources and initiatives that has helped students in the classroom. And I'm gonna share three with you that you could also implement at home. The first one is quiet time, then logical consequences and take a break spot. So what is quiet time? I want you to think about a child who is going out of recess, let's say, and he or she went to the playground and started playing soccer in the middle of the field in the sun. So he or she played soccer for 30 minutes or 25 minutes, and then the blow whistles and it's time to line up to go back to the classroom. What do you think is gonna happen with that child is asked to sit down and focus? Do you think that child would be able to focus? Maybe yes, or maybe they need something to help them transition. So this is quiet time. It offers the opportunity to transition back into school activities in a purposeful and relaxed way so that they are ready for an afternoon of learning. And this is something that could happen at home too. I don't know if you want to mention on the chat, if you, have observed this in your child, that transitioning from playing time to Zoom activities is challenging for you or for them to settle. And you can mention that in the chat if you have some examples. So while you do that, I will describe the structure of quiet time. It's not just being quiet and do nothing. It is very important to determine the amount of time that there are like using that quiet time. First, it can be um, 10 minutes break and it can, it can take up to 15 minutes. The, the most important thing is that you use it after high level of activity. It can be lunch, play, play time, breaks, 
uh, whatever you consider is um, is exciting your child a lot and you find it difficult for them to go back to Zoom classes or CISO activities. The second one is give them choices. They're not just staying quiet and sitting down, no. They can do activities related to school, like reading, writing, but things on their, on their, of their own preference. Or they could also like make puzzles or build with blocks or just relax and do breathing exercises. Um, you can you can choose and provide them with limited choices and then they can feel more engaged because they will choose from those options and this is a big question what are adults doing at that time if you are close to your child during quiet time you can use it as a break and engage in similar activities because if they're in quiet time and you are close speaking and moving around it would send like an uh, um, child, a difficult message for them to understand. So if you're going to be around them when they're doing quiet time, you need, you need to do similar activities. And this is not only for transition. So there are other skills that you are modeling to them during quiet time. First of all, it's transitioning into activities from a high level of activity to an activity that requires more focus. Also making productive choices while they are in quiet time and what to do when finished because this is something that i hear a lot from parents my child finished the activity from the zoom class and then there's nothing they can do and this is a way for them to wait until the whole group completes what they're doing the second one okay i read a comment here is there any possibility that these sessions Okay, we can talk about that later. Okay, logical consequences. Okay, now I want you to picture yourself when you were in first or second grade. Imagine that you had an argument with someone with a, with a classmate and then your teacher caught you. Your teacher is not happy about what happened and she or he tells you that now you need to write down 30 times that you are not going to be rude to anyone else in school and that you're also going to miss recess for a whole week. Do you think this is a logical consequence? Yes or no? Because this was very common back in the days. So why logical consequences? Because they help our children take responsibility for the effects of their actions. And they need to be, the consequences need to be, um, they need to be relevant. So that means that they need to be directly related to the misbehavior. If you are rude to someone, if your child is rude to someone, to you, to a sibling, to a nanny, to a teacher, is it um, relevant or directly related to the behavior to take away, I don't know, technology or playtime from them? Not so much. They need to be realistic, something the child can reasonably be expected to do and something that the adult can manage complying with. And respectful, communicate it kindly, focus on the misbehavior or the behavior and not the child's character or personality. In the previous example, you are not telling your child that you are rude, that they are rude. You are saying what you said was rude. The comment was rude towards your friend. And here's a comparison chart between punishment and logical consequences. This is for teachers, but this could also apply for home as well. And they are basically different in intention first, because the, the important thing here with the consequences is that they learn that their actions have some effects and to develop self-regulation. The underlying belief is that children want to do better and they can with reflection and practice. The adult's approach is not judging, but gathering information first and using a calm and matter of fact tone. The nature of the consequence needs to be related to behavior and reasonable to the child. So back in the days, the common consequence was to take, like students were supposed to miss recess. And unfortunately that wasn't always related to the behavior. 
So at home, for example, taking technology out of them maybe could be something they regret, but it's not related to that behavior all the time. And then the message to the child, the damage done and not the child is the problem. Always focus on the behavior and not them as a person. Okay, so I'm going to share three strategies related to logical consequences. The first one is you break it, you fix it. So something is broken or a mess has been made and it's not only like met, like uh, objects, you could also hurt someone's feelings or break a relationship. And then they need to take responsibility for fixing it. If, they, if a child makes a rude comment about someone else, about a sibling, about you, the teacher, how can they take responsibility for their words and fix it? Maybe they need to say, I'm sorry. Maybe they need to explain themselves. Uh, I'm sorry, I was feeling angry because something else happened to me. It would never happen again. And that gives them the opportunity to solve a problem that he or she has caused. At the end, the message is we can learn from our mistakes. And this, uh, this avoids that they continue feeling guilty about or ashamed about what they did. The second one is loss of privileges. So this is often used when behavior does not meet expectations, when students are um, rude, when they're not following directions, when they are reluctant to participate, when they are defiant, maybe sometimes. So think about your child if something like this happens at home. When, the, when they lose privilege, it needs to be for a brief time. For in the example that we used previously, taking away recess for a whole week might not be the best consequence for them. So taking away the, something they like at home for a whole week might be too much. And it also depends on the age of the child, of course. And it needs to be directly related to the behavior. So for example, if your child is uh, not using a toy appropriately, then you might take away that toy and explain, explain to them that they're not showing that they know how to use it appropriately and that they're, you're gonna model that for them and then you're gonna give them a second chance. Okay, do you have any questions so far? You can always use the chat. And the last one is take a break spot. So now think about yourself. When you are overwhelmed, when you are too sad, when you are angry, or even when you are too excited, what do you do to take a break? Where did you go? What did you do? What are the strategies that work for you? This is something that we mostly develop naturally, but it is also very useful to teach our children how to do it on their own. So the take a break spot in responsive classroom is called timeout, positive timeout. It could also be called take a break or rest and return. When it is used calmly, consistently, and respectfully, it can be a valuable strategy to help them develop their self-regulation. We used to have this in school and in every classroom and it was amazing. It has some guidelines, of course. The first one is to start proactively teaching expectations. So this is a, this is basically a place that you're gonna choose at home. And this place can have different activities that they can do to calm down. It will depend on your child. It can be, it can uh, include books, pillows, manipulatives, um, coloring pencils, paper, anything that you consider could help your child um, you know, relax and calm down. So you start by proactively teaching expected behaviors. First, you set some expectations with your child and you translate those expectations into actions. So for example, saying you need to log in soon early. That might be very confusing for them. What does early mean? Or you can say you need to log in um, soon at eight in the morning which is like a specific action they have to do. 
you need to explain the purpose of the take a break and it is to help them self-regulate and restore the focus and the emotional regulation and control they need to learn. You need to let them know that sometimes they can decide to go them there by themselves and not as a way of avoiding assignments or things they need to do. It's when they really feel overwhelmed and they need to cool down and relax. Also, you need to establish the amount of time that they're gonna spend there. Um, mostly like five to 10 minutes is okay. The third one is always use a calm voice, quiet voice and few words. Keeping your cool will have a positive impact on the situation's outcome. This might be challenging for adults, but key to have positive results. And the last one, use it earlier than later. So this is like, a, this is for prevention, okay? So when you see the signs that your child is getting frustrated or mad, you can guide them to go to the take a break spot and use one of the strategies that they need to calm down. There's also some charts that I, I can provide to you with different cards of feelings and they can, uh, they can show with the cards that they're feeling sad, frustrated, angry, and then choose from a couple of options. What strategy are they gonna use? And after that, evaluate if they're now ready to go back. And, and it also prevents the behavior to escalate. So something really important for the take a break is that you explicitly te teach the procedure. So the first step would be guide your child to go quickly and calmly to the take a break spot. First of all, you need to choose a spot with him or her. And it needs to be a place that is safe, that is visible for adults around, um, not hidden, and somewhere that they feel like relaxed. Then you choose the calming down strategies and you can also give them feedback about the things that work for you. Maybe drink a glass of water or read a book or make a drawing color or play with Legos. Nothing that has to do with technology. Do a breathing exercise, do a mindful exercise, um, whatever works for him or her. And it's also like a trial and error thing you can try some strategies and maybe they don't work and you can always change, review and change. Then they need to ask themselves and know when they are ready to go back. And here you can use like a, like a keyword or a key phrase for them to communicate to you that they're ready. They could say, I'm ready to go back or I'm ready and then uh, return promptly. Return promptly to the Zoom meeting or whatever activity they are doing. So this, this is it. Um, now, if you have any questions, please use the chat or feel free to unmute yourselves. Any questions or comments, if you find these tools useful for you at home. Or Ms. Manzanares, I don't know if you wanna Share something because she's also uh, here. I'm sorry, I was I was a little late, Ms. Roxana, <laughs> and I was wondering if you mentioned that for the breakout room, this is not a negative um, spot, but just a place where you can go and calm yourself down. It's not like a timeout. Yeah, it's not a punishment. It's not a timeout. It's actually, and, and when we when we started to implement this in school two years ago, in the classrooms, we told students like, you know, we also need to take a break sometimes as adults. Sometimes I need to go to my office and just like breathe for a couple minutes or count to ten, or call a friend, and then we evaluated different options that were possible in school or not. So in those meetings where we introduce the take a break spot in school, um, they share, okay, to calm down, I hug my mom. And we ask them, right, that's a perfect strategy, but is your mom here in school? No, okay, that is a strategy that is not gonna work for school. So you can do the same process with them at home and figure out what are the strategies that are actually possible and that could work at home for you. 
and always tell them that it's not that they are removed from a situation that they enjoy. No, it's because they are having feelings that are overwhelming and they need a time and space to just calm down and relax and be ready to go back. And it's not only for anger, you know, sometimes as we mentioned in the example uh, before, sometimes they're playing outside or doing a high level activity and they're too excited, they need to focus then and it's difficult for them to transition. So it could also work for that purpose. Okay, it says, thank you so much. I really like the idea of quiet time space and the cards to choose their emotion with which helps them analyze. Yes, I'm going to upload the cards on the um, website so that you can download the PDF. It has some cards that you can print and cut and include different feelings. It has many, many feelings. So I, I recommend that you choose five, the most important ones, uh, maybe frustrated, sad, angry, overwhelmed, excited. And then it also includes some strategies to calm down. And you can also have this conversation with them and decide which ones are you going to try at first. I like the idea of acknowledging that our little ones have feelings just like adults totally and are also learning to manage their emotions. Yes. And, and it's very important for us to, they are looking at us. And I think we've mentioned that in previous webinars, they're always looking at us. We are models for them. And we need to be very mindful about how we manage our own emotions. And of course, it doesn't have to be perfect, but as, they are as we are trying to teach them to find ways to regulate themselves and their emotions, we as adults also need to think about how are we dealing with our stress, with our anger, with our frustration, because um, that also uh, has an impact on their behaviors. So, and these are all things that we have already tried in, in the, like at the Met. Yes. And they work. <laughs> they work, totally. Thank you, Ms. Roxana. And yes. thank you, parents. There's another question. The details will, yes. will be available in the Met, oh. Met website. Yes. Once we upload the YouTube video, I will upload the resources as well. And then you can you will be able to download the PDF. So okay. Thank you very much for joining us today. We really enjoy spending this time with you. So next week we'll continue. It's gonna be for upper elementary. Um so thank you very much and see you next week. Have a nice afternoon. Have a nice afternoon.